My mental health tried to drag me under, but I'm back. And I have some unfinished business to attend to, as there were quite a few episodes that I missed along the way. And this video is going to be tackling seven of them. Yep, episodes 7 through to 13 of Season 9 of MLP are finally going to get the attention they deserve, and one hell of a beating to go along with it. So sit back, grab some food, and relax. This video of analysis and review is going to be a bit of a doozy. On this, a missed episode edition of Pones and Stuff. My Fair Lady being used as a story inspiration and cultural touchstone in 2019 is about as relevant as a geriatric old man at the park. It should be nowhere near your kids unless it's related to them. The fact that She's All Yak, an MLP episode, has decided to have a crack at it anyway means I will have to allow it within 50 meters of them, against my better judgment. Now, given how this show has preached acceptance and being true to yourself before and subsequently in episodes, we'll get to that a bit later. Later, I don't understand why an over 100 year old play and its subsequent over 50 year old film adaptation needed a reworking when it's been done to death already in visual media. I guess the characters fit like a glove and the writers couldn't help themselves. However, it is actually a problem because its over reliance on and the predictability of this source material's influence led the story and themes to be dragged down, feeling unnecessary burdened and clumsily forced. Thankfully, it avoided drowning by being somewhat consistent with its pacing and just giving enough comedy to make this serious episode be funny in order to break the ice when necessary. It was a great character showcase for Yona as the Eliza Doolittle in this scenario, while Rarity's playing a Professor Higgins provided a great supporting role as they bounced off each other well. The rest of the cast though, oh, they felt about as shoehorned and dampened the experience as they could have done given that they were only there for window dressing. The blurred lines of what Yona wanted and the impact of societal expectations changing over time but being forced forced onto those who didn't know any better was intriguing, but was left gasping for air amongst the madness of the process. Thankfully, Sandbar's heartwarming saving grace in the third act made me want to forgive its shortcomings for at least making the message stand proudly, while not minding its scorched feet underneath. It felt like Sweet and Elite Part 2, but was different enough in its execution for me to not be too harsh on it. The musical number fit right in, gets better after every single listen, but fitting of Rarity's consistently solid output, while the background music had a decent amount of genre variety to keep me on my toes. However, the use of an unnecessary reprise and an uneven spread of BG GM's lessons its good record, whilst visually there was enough changing locations, costumes and dynamic movement and transitions to stand out, but similarly was not spread out evenly enough for its own good outside of the musical number. When all is said and done, this episode was better than I expected, but it's still underwhelmed given how the source material that it was influenced by controlled and subsequently crushed proceedings, meaning it just didn't have a lot of room to manoeuvre. But when it did, it was fun, yet when it didn't, it was equally frustrating meaning the positives and negatives of this kind of even each other out at the end of the day. It wasn't as bad as it could have been, mind you, so I'll take what I can with that and move on swiftly. Overall, She's All Yak scored a total of 13 out of 25, which is a C, bang on average. And to tell you, once again, I expected much worse, so this episode should be pretty happy with itself right now. If that statement I've just made is correct in any way, then the prior episode represents the family SUV coasting down the highway at a very, very good mediated speed, obeying the law and just getting itself to the destination within its own time. Well, right behind it in its wing mirror, Frenemy storms down the highway over the speed limit, high off its own face, and doing so, getting it to its destination without needing to stop for gas or even bothering to look back at what it's overtaken. And there's a lot of good reasons as to why it managed to do so. As one of the benefits of focusing on characters that haven't been developed much or we've not been overexposed to is that everything they do feels fresh. So when the task at hand is accelerating the season's overarching narrative, giving the villains some much needed growth, showcasing the best musical number of the season, and having everything pretty much hit the mark as it goes, there is no doubt that I will be reveling in its success. 
the journey of Tyrek, Cozy Glow and Chrysalis trying to retain their individuality and evil autonomy in the shadow of and eventually succumbing to Teamwork's warm bosom before rejecting it out of fear was a wonderfully pompous, fun and stupendous occasion, with Grogar's three henchmen hamming up their insidious villainy to cartoonish levels of brilliance but keeping the tight story, absorbing its simple visuals and a fundamentally vigorous message well within its grasp. A better way to be bad, a glorious toe-tapping tango piece elevated the early exchanges to top tier entertainment while the rest showed all three off individually making you realise how good of a team they are and would need to be to get things to work out. Something that Cozy Glow wanted from the start for her manipulative benefit of course. If you didn't realise how close she got to actually achieving her goal, re-watch this episode because it adds another layer of depth to proceedings. It is brilliant. Now to keep them scheming against their overlord was a masterstroke in building more exposition and tension for future episodes to follow. All while blending some comedy and action, it all flowed so smoothly. Hell, the only complaint I have to bring forward is that it was missing some transitions and interesting cuts and the occasional little tiny set piece or something to push it over the edge into perfect territory. Now it may have missed out on the top step of the podium, but it got across the line well ahead of most of its competition with room to spare. And if there's one episode that you need to see from this season thus far, it's this one, as it's the most original, engrossing, and smile inducing the show has been for a while. And all that had to be done to ensure of that was spice things up by throwing the odd curveball or two into the mix. Now if Sparkle 7 was a masterclass in utilizing a similar formula to bring laughter and joy out of long established ones, this did just as good but slightly better on the other side of the table. This must mean when they both collide together, it should be perfection. That's how it goes, right? Overall, Frenemies scored a total of 24 out of 25, which is an A, making it the best episode of the season that I reviewed thus far. Will any come to match it? Hopefully in this video, we might have an answer. Going into this episode, I had a bit more expectation compared to the episodes I have already reviewed in this video, and to say that those expectations were not met was an understatement to say the least. It had the ingredients that if they were mixed in properly could have been baked into a lovely episodic cake that I could have feasted on happily. Sadly though, it sunk upon contact with the oven and tasted of putrid garbage. Spike, Smolder, Ember and Garble all deserved better than this absolute mess. Well, at least Fluttish I benefited from it, but that's all I can barely muster to praise this, as all else it brought to the table went mouldy long before its time in the sun came and passed. And the title of Sweet and Smoky didn't really help either, as it sounded like it was ripped straight from a Maybelline eyeshadow palette, and the soft underbelly that comes with those naming connotations were on display throughout. It felt content to lumber around a sense of reluctant carelessness as misguided character writing and fluctuating pace and a tone that was about as stable as a thrown bouncy ball ensured that it never got out of first gear and floundered within the barren visual and audio barracks it found itself contained in. Despite having Ember needing to solve a crisis in the Dragonlands, Garble and Spike resolving their differences, Smolder revealing Garble to be her older brother and Fluttershy being adorable and scary as hell in equal measure, I have to ask one important question. How the hell did this become the most uninteresting and boring thing to watch? All I can say is that even with two plot points making themselves known, they had a lack of cohesion that made it structurally unsafe and everything else followed suit with it. Somehow, though, the voice acting and quality of the moral at hand peek up from the ashes to provide some clarity, but they were equally mishandled as they were submerged for too long to make their presence known until the very end, especially in the latter's case. The way Garble's sensitive side was handled while his character was still as abrasive as ever was an indication that no care had been given to allow sympathy to at least in some part grow for one of this show's most annoying recurring antagonists. Seriously, because he's emotional, and sensitive, he has to be artistic and creative. What kind of outdated BS is that? Anyway, it was the death knell for this episode, as without purpose and proper direction, it dragged itself further down into the mire, from where it would honestly never return. And, and even after removing my negative preconceptions surrounding my prediction for Garble not manifesting itself from the equation, 
I knew this would be bad. Yet still, I didn't expect it to fall so far, breaking so many limbs along the way and not being able to grab onto anything to save itself. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what happens when you underbake everything an episode has and don't care at all for the promise that a story can have. Overall, Sweet and Smoky scored a total of 3 out of 25, which is an E. Quite a fall from grace considering the last two we've had. <sighs> Let's hope we're not gonna have another stupendous run of inconsistency. Let's move on to the next one and see what happens. After that hot sulfur infused mess, I needed a nice rebate to calm me down and bring me to ground level without busting my ankles when I landed. And surprisingly, catching me off guard, it was Applejack, of all characters, who delivered those goods. I color me speechless, I did not see this one coming. Going to Seed, in my humble critical opinion, might be the finest episode that Background Pony herself has been at the helm for, and let me stress, been at the helm for, as it defied expectation and showed growth in her obtuse and firmly rooted character that I've been long waiting for. And while she was predictably as stubborn as a mule, she showed restraint, understanding, and empathy towards Apple Bloom, something that you rarely ever saw generally out of her demeanor, showing that her relationship with her sister was not as antagonistic as prior episodes had implied, whilst she emboldened the moral of reminding yourself that you're still a kid at heart no matter how old you grow. It was lovely, as this moral and the slice of life story of Sweet Apple Acre's legend was buoyant, intriguing, and fun not feeling as cumbersome as prior Applejack episodes had been. It allowed room to let itself loose while still being as focused as possible, delivering all it could along the way. Now sure, the story was as measly written as possible, with not a lot of depth, wanting to stick its perennial shovel in the mud and not move a muscle, as its themes of maturing into adulthood felt transparent and thin alongside it, while the visuals were, outside of some glimmers of quality, stunningly static for about half of its runtime before kicking its ass into gear just when it needed to at the end, because we need to be appeased, right? Now, that is pretty much where the bad things can be drawn under the bridge, because the quality of the cast and their voice acting as well as a vibrant score supported it to the finish line. It may have been out of breath, but it deserved its medal at the end of the day. As famed anime and manga author Hayao Miyazaki once said, the characters are the story. If those within the world can make you feel along with them and drive things forward, a story can be as flimsy as this and not be too detrimental and have their effects show here. It was endearing, funny and surprisingly tense on occasion despite showing its true colours a bit too much for my liking to score any higher. Regardless, it was an episode that caught me completely out of left field and showed that the mantra of this season was definitely alive and well, giving us characters that we've loved in a way that closes their arcs well. well that's what we'd be hoping for anyway given it is the last bloody season. And after years of underwhelming, disappointing, and infuriating Applejack episodes, I'm happy to say that this was one of the best of the lot. In fact, it was the best of the lot. Yes, A Perfect Pair and Bats were better episodes in totality, but they didn't focus solely on Applejack, so by that process of elimination, I have to give this one a lot of credit. An episode that some substance was worthy of my time from a character that I have much maligned in the past. It was long overdue and worthy of my praise that I am definitely piling upon it. Sometimes the most uneventful of harvests can bear the most plentiful fruit. Overall, Going to Seed scored a total of 16 out of 25, which is a B minus. Now that is more like it. If you were to read to me the list of characters who appeared in this episode, you would think that I would have loved it with no sense of shame. Starlight, Trixie, Sunburst, oh my, Maud, Mudbriar, Terramar, holy cow! All in one episode? What could possibly go wrong? A decent amount, actually, much to my dismay. When Student Council provided me with the cast of Season 7's disastrous Uncommon Bond, one Twilight short with the hippogriff substituting for her, I was anxious that it wouldn't be able to climb above the ether that its brethren had been festering in for the last year and a half since its airing. But despite my prior judgement, it actually managed to, albeit with quite a few scars from its trepidatious travel on show for all to see. The choice of shoving a dramatic search party for the missing Silverstream into the story felt completely 
completely necessary, as the writers knew that just showing off the negligible and boring side of Starlight's social and work life wouldn't have been able to sustain this episode by itself, and while it was a welcome tonic to freshen up proceedings, it didn't retain its carbonation for long, as it meandered through occasional hilarity and diminished returns, as bubbling tension and occasional laughs couldn't keep its head above water for long. This was thanks to mostly absent visuals, uneven pace, and timing like many episodes thus far this season, giving a frantic and notable lack of cohesion despite a noble attempt at trying to do the opposite, but stumbling under hoof more often than not. Adding to the pile, aspects of past episodes were often referenced just for the plot's convenience, showing just how watered down this entire affair was. Everything else then had to fight in the shadow of the poor story and visuals and what it had created, and did their damnedest to give their all to try and save some face anyway. The music was softly accented when needed to make the comedy spring to life, and tension be propelled forward to drag its limp carcass across the line, providing just enough frivolity to be pleasing. While the moral about how damaging overworking can be to your social life flowed through this episode like a lifeboat against its fleeting story, with thematic importance giving it a nice boost, but sadly the explanation of said morals at the episode's conclusion came at Starlight's expense, meaning it neutered their impact and made them feel more akin to a joke than actually important, relevant and useful to people outside of the show, which is what these are meant to be. The diverse range of voice acting, though, across the stellar cast of characters helps support resolute portrayals of all of them, which didn't stray far from the norm, I will admit, but provided enough flexibility to be stable enough to actually float on without sinking. I've used a lot of uh, naval uh, <laughs> statements here. It's all founded, as this was an episode that I expected to be underwhelming, and it honestly was, but it tried its hardest to swim against the current and not do a sweet and smoky and fight for its goddamn life, and it managed to regain some composure. However, it still saddens me that they had to inject life into an episode like this so suddenly. Then again, it was one slip away from missing the vein and becoming another showstoppers in having two separate sides of a plot that just don't really help and make it all just crumble beneath itself. Thankfully it wasn't that, but I'm not shying away from just how perilous it could have been, as this rating I'm about to give looks pretty kind, but displays that definitive statement emphatically. Overall, Student Council scored a total of 9 out of 25, which is a D+. I mean, it's not terrible, but just like I mentioned, it could have been far, far worse. Let's just hope the next episode can have more stable ground underfoot. The Last Crusade, an episode title that was stunningly prophetic. An episode that gave us the celebration of the show's best supporting characters in their final crusading adventure, accented and supplemented by the long-awaited reveal of Scootaloo's parents, and much to the surprise of many, her lesbian aunts, who were just a delight, I may add, making this quite the loaded affair indeed. However, with the substantial weight of the lore-expanding and character-developing impact of what this episode produced, it struggled to maintain its composure under pressure. The story, while full of heart-wrenching, heartwarming, and dramatic depth, found it hard to capitalize on it thanks to poorly placed comedy and a pace that struggled to adapt to the themes of separation, devotion, and community importance that had to be stretched to fit the time frame at hand, despite the fact that this wasn't a packed episode that was struggling for it. The conflict in its progression was foreshadowable as it inevitably could have been, while the animation mostly relied on new character designs and occasional moments of flair to bring itself to the fold, with some albeit stuttering confidence. Scootaloo's intense emotional arc was given a dramatic ending that showcased her parents to be self-centered, but not in a devious or negative way, as it highlighted the independence they had gained of not having their kid around for so long, meant that the misunderstanding could drive things forward and not be too idiotic. Some people may have thought so, but not to me, as the CMC showed their unity in such a powerful way to, well, just highlight how bonded these three fillies have become, and while the Kentucky Fried Crusaders aren't offered the sympathetic middle ground to build the plot around and push the actions forward, it 
quite ensured that it worked well, despite the fact that Philly's oblivious schemes to try and trick Scootaloo's parents into not moving away with her proved to be the most mundane and uninspiring moment of the episode that just dragged the story and them down with it. It left the two morals, then, with the hardest task of all, to highlight that being separated from your passion isn't right, and listening to those who you care about understand their feelings in all aspects of life, without doing so without being laboured and testing. Now, it managed to deliver somewhat thanks to the characters at hand not shying away from them, but it lacked in stable execution and relied on bluntness too much, which meant that it soured the efforts that they had strived to make, despite the ending being a rousing emotive success. And well, much like the other aspects of this episode, it just always seemed like it wanted to shoot itself in the foot whenever it was just starting to soar into the sky. Any good point I bring inevitably has a negative one to counteract it. So as a result, with all these things taken into account, I was worried that a long-anticipated episode such as this was not going to live up to expectation and disappoint wholeheartedly. But thankfully, William Anderson's score came in and saved the day as it was sweet, empathetic, and uplifting, and it gave it the kick up the arse it needed to feel as full and well-rounded as possible, filling in the gaps where the characters couldn't, despite leaving some noticeable cracks on display, proving that it wasn't going to be taking all the credit for the hard work, giving other aspects their chance in the sun, but they didn't dry fully, which does lead to a few questions needed to be asked. Was this episode worth the wait? Just about. Did it provide a nice closing chapter on the CMCs as their main story arc ended? I would say yes. Was it as stunning as it could have been? No, because it needed a bit more flexibility and assuredness to do so, but I will reward its efforts accordingly for at least trying to clamber back and make those efforts mean something. All in all, it was pretty good. What else can I say, really? Overall, The Last Crusade scored a total of 15 out of 25, which is a C+. Now that's nice. After Student Council, an above average episode. That is the kind of footing I needed to stand on. We have one more episode to go, folks. Let's hope it can end things with a rousing ray of sunshine. Between repeatedly getting the name of this episode wrong and judging it unfairly based on what it contained within, Between Dark and Dawn gave me the unbelievably fun Celestia and Luna character development junk food that I was craving as a watcher and critic of this show. It gave me a well-rounded portrayal of them as individuals while using the moral to highlight how much they are with and aren't without each other. It was heartwarming, sentimental, but most importantly, rip-roaringly hilarious. An adventure worth seeing as the visuals played along with dynamic movement, character faces, visual plentitudes and frivolities as the novelty of this occasion played its hand brilliantly. The musical number, Lot of Little Things, ensured the latter part was done while it pleased the ears instrumentally and highlighted that its reprise was actually a good example of doing one by altering the lyrics, vocals, tempo, musical quality and tone, making itself remarkably different from its predecessor. It seemed like this episode then couldn't put a foot wrong as it was nigh on paced perfectly, with musical numbers and montages controlling the speed, the structure was well attended to as the story blossomed in the right places at the right times and allowed its conflicts not be too blunt or burdensome as it gave the morals and thematic weight to carry itself. All seemed like this was going to rise up to the cream at the top of the milk that this season is. However, there are fractures in this episode's pristine appearance that need to be attended to. The secondary plot surrounding Twilight and the main six taking charge of their duties holding a gala for the castle swans while proving great satire of needlessly royal tasks proved to be its downfall as it was just filler to back up the main story just in case it couldn't do the job on its own. It provided tonal contrast that wasn't a good balance while offering up pretty much another excuse for Twilight to prove she hadn't learnt from lessons of morals that were exhibited in prior episodes from not just this season but the last one as well. This was 
was damaging to a point where this episode, whenever it appeared, lost all sense of decorum and brought it to a shuddering halt. And whilst alongside it, when the musical numbers weren't on, the score didn't make my brain do anything of intrigue. It rarely rattled the bones or eardrums, providing strong enough of a body blow to take the wind out of its sails even more so. Anyway, regardless of that, I thoroughly enjoyed this episode. Mostly because that secondary plot was not as prevalent as it honestly could have been, and thankfully not as much as I feared it would be. Now, that implies the balance issues I've noted were very much noticeable, and they were, and this defined it. But it didn't sour my enjoyment to the point where I wanted to flip a table in its incompetence. I spent more time reveling in the fantastic showcase of Celestia and Luna making me laugh my ass off, cry tears of joy, and just be overly ecstatic at what I was experiencing. This episode is a treasure that the season will thank its lucky stars it managed to have, and for a final season episode giving us something we've never seen, this ticked almost all the right boxes. Overall, Between Dark and Dawn scored a total of 19 out of 25, which is a B plus, and that is a lovely way to end things on. In closing, oh, I'm not entirely sure what I can say. I'm a little bit speechless because given what we got at the beginning of this season, you know, inconsistency abound, I was thinking that the episodes I'd missed based on the synopsis and what I'd seen and or heard of them, I thought, oh, this is going to be more of the same, isn't it? Thankfully, I was proven wrong because we got seven episodes here that were for the most part pretty damn good and I am immensely pleased with that. Now, sure, we got a couple of duds in there. I mean, Sweet and Smoky was a dumpster fire and Student Council was as disappointing as one could be, but the rest of them, they go in this order from average to above average to great to pretty fantastic to one of the best that this show has ever done and given what we started with i was not expecting any of that so dhx all spark you get my seal of approval here by delivering the consistency that this season needed to stabilize itself and you did this right before the summer hiatus you built all those who actually watched them on time legally <laughs> you blessed them with something quite brilliant and i'm loving that and it meant that the second half could start up pretty well. I, I'm just wishing that my mental health didn't get in the way as much as it did, because I wasn't able to enjoy these on a casual level, let alone pick them apart logically and analytically, of course. So when I finally got to them, boy, was I shocked. I thought, whoa, <laughs> they kicked their ass into gear and gave us exactly what we needed, what the season needed. And it went into the summer hiatus with a smile on its face and a flag to wave proudly, so I, d I don't know what else I can say, except that I'm amazed and happy that it actually happened. My wishes came true. <laughs> yeah, the point of no return was then a deer, and this is definitely the springboard that I needed to jump on to say to season 9, I want to hug you rather than punch you now. However, <laughs> just because the first half ended brilliantly doesn't mean the beginning of the second half can effectively be given the free pass. I still have to get through another missed episodes video full of other episodes that I've not been able to give my attention to, so you're going to have to wait until that comes around to see where the rest of the ratings and grades go, but I hope you're eagerly anticipating it and your appetite has been whetted thanks to what I've produced here, and yes, it's going to be a long struggle to get videos back on the conveyor belt again, I'm taking things ever so slowly, one step at a time to ensure I don't burn out and fail spectacularly like I did before, but if the quality of episodes here are any indication, and the fact I've been able to turn this around relatively quickly given the circumstance, anything's possible, and I could be in for another good run of episodes to critique and analyse, and you'll be in, hopefully in soon enough as possible, another video to enjoy to your heart's content. Let's pray it all goes down that way, huh? Let's pray indeed. I have been Freddie Thomas, you've been people watching, this has been the CC Network, and I will see you all next time.